Hey, everyone. I'm here uh, with Christo Avalis. He is a labor historian and YouTuber. And we have a couple topics to uh, discuss with you today. So we will get into democratic socialism and Christo's view of democratic socialism, uh, as well as another topic uh, to begin with. But first, Christo, how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, it's always good having you on. I feel like uh, every time we ha uh, I have you on, we have a uh, a lot to talk about, and there's always a lot that people can learn from these discussions, so I'm glad to have you back on again. So the first topic I want to get into is something you brought up in our discussions uh, before this interview, and that's how you feel that progressives in the U.S. idealize Canada, and how that's actually bad for progressives on both sides of the border. So get into uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any denying that in many ways Canada's better, so it's not, you know... Uh, it's not like I'm saying, you know, don't talk about the true realities about how, you know, you don't get a $40,000 bill for going to the hospital. But, you know, when Bernie came to Canada on the insulin caravan, there was a lot of coverage about cheap Canadian drugs. And it's true that insulin is much cheaper in Canada than it is in the States. But, you know, there are still like, you know, a million Canadians a year that basically choose between getting their medicine and 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 getting their other basic necessities and that's just who people who who have admitted it in studies and many people cut their pills in half or in thirds and people often go to the hospital for free or go to their clinic for free but then get a, then get a prescription they can't afford and so we have a lot of issues with our healthcare system and in general Canada gets a lot of praise for being this land of of you know, uh, small L liberalism, we're, we're a much more progressive society, but we have issues of racism here in Canada. We have issues of discrimination against Canada, uh, not only against our, our indigenous people, but against people of color in the city through police discrimination. We have carding in Canada, which is sort of a soft form of stop and frisk in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's like we have a lot of issues. And my concern is that when Americans idealize Canada, left Americans even, they sort of uh, prevent us on the left in Canada from having uh, being able to push further. And I sort of think they limit themselves because, mm. you know, when they talk about Medicare for all, Bernie's vision is actually more radical than what we have in Canada. He wants to include things that aren't included in Canada. And when American progressives say we want what Canada has, well, no, you don't. You want something better than what we have. <laughs> you want yeah. you want your medicine covered. You want your teeth covered. You want mental health covered. No, you know, none of those are covered in Canada, like at mm -hmm. all, right? Yeah. I mean, so the, it's this. Yeah, it's the same thing here. It's like your workplace. You might have health insurance through your workplace, but even then, there's deductibles and copays and things like that there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something I kind of struggle with as well because a lot of my content uh, covers American politics, and as a Canadian. I feel like I can offer a uh, sort of an outsider perspective on many of these issues. Yeah. So it, I feel like it can oftentimes come off uh, in a way where I, even I'm uh, idealizing Canada and, and our healthcare system, yeah. but it's more as a way to try and clue in Americans on kind of what they're missing out on. So that it's almost like yeah. uh, people like us that talk about politics on both sides of the border, we almost have to be aware of our audiences yeah. and yeah. Uh, even in the context of discussing Canadian healthcare, for example, um, just point out, even if it's just briefly, say that hey, our, our healthcare system isn't perfect. I mean, all these universal so systems have their own issues, but understand yeah. that our issues are uh, not to the same extent as what Americans are currently experiencing. But uh, yeah. but at the same time, I think it's also as you point out. I mean, Bernie's uh, healthcare plan it it covers dental, covers vision. We don't have that here. So no. it's it's sort of like this. If I mean, if the American if the American system if they actually move to a Medicare for all system, will start idealizing Americans and, and want to uh, kind of a, you know achieve what, what what they have. But I I think it's important what you point out here that we have to be uh, aware that even in our uh, even in our own country, even if we may have it better in in some sense than than Americans do, uh, to be aware that. That doesn't mean that we are just, you know, settled and, and we're content that to that we need to continue pushing and uh, expect better uh, of our country, of our government, of society than um, than simply comparing us to uh, Americans. So is that sort of what you're you're uh, you're getting at? Yeah, then pretty much. I mean, there's a few things there. One in Canada, we are there is, you know, the NDP in this election under Jagmeet Singh's leadership is kind of pushing for what he's calling a head to toe Medicare plan 
which includes all the stuff that it includes now, which means like if you go to the hospital or you go to see your, your GP, then like, you know, you don't have to worry. You, you, you use a health card, not your credit card. But if you need vision care or dental care or pharmaceutical stuff or often mental health services, you often have to pay for those things or hope you have workplace insurance. And even then again, you might still have to pay. So there are people pushing for more comprehensive visions. And actually, to his credit, Bernie Sanders sort of, um, you know, fought for this vision when he came to Canada. Bernie basically said, like, I know here in Canada, your system isn't perfect. He he came here last year, like just before the Ontario election and gave a talk at the U of T. Mm -hmm. And he said that. So so Bernie Sanders is actually pretty on point here where he's like, Canada, you got a better system. But you guys, your system's not great either. Canada's the universal healthcare system and yet that system doesn't include basics like 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 medicine access we're the only industrialized country that has one but not the other and so it's a it's really telling in that sense what we're what we're missing and i agree you want to tell americans that look the the positives in our system are really good but the negatives in our system are sort of the negatives you guys have so we have to get rid of those too right yeah exactly um So let's move on to, to democratic socialism because I there's a there's there's various definitions of, of socialism and, and democratic socialism. Everybody seems to have kind of their, their own take on it, but it never really to me it never really fully came together until you really put it I think perfectly in in your video on how you have these these three pillars uh, that encompass democratic socialism for you. So let's kind of go through those three pillars actually. Before we even get to that, let's discuss uh, Bernie's uh, Bernie Sanders his his vision of uh, democratic socialism and um, uh, how you feel or what are your thoughts on on how Bernie um, communicates uh, democratic socialism in in his eyes? Yeah, so Bernie's democratic socialism is mostly not exclusively, but it's mostly focused on uh, the 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 basic guarantee of universal human dignity. And I think that's a core element of socialism, which is that whether you're rich or you're poor or you're in between, um, no no basic human dignity should be denied from you. And so he says that's why he wants to provide free post-secondary education. He wants to, uh, you know, help people uh, find work. He wants to, you know, he's talked about a job guarantee. He's talked about, you know, Medicare for all, like providing truly comprehensive health care regardless of your income or your workplace status. And for Bernie, for the most part, his vision of democratic socialism is a redistribution of wealth to ensure that there's universal human access to those basic needs. Now, that's that's a, a sort of definition of democratic socialism, which doesn't really fully challenge the idea of the ownership of the means of production or the broader question of economic democracy. Although it should be said that Bernie Sanders, from time to time, has talked about um, you know, empowering unions, which is a key part of mm-hmm. a democratic socialist society, but not just empowering unions, because unions on their own are always sort of relegated to demanding from the employer. And it's always mm-hmm. even the most powerful unions in, in, in traditional collective bargaining make demands of the employer and the employer will ultimately say yes or no. And there may be strikes and there may be lockouts. But the end result is the employer, the employees ask the employer uh, makes the decision. Yeah. Under Bernie, some of Bernie's proposals, he wants to see workers on corporate boards. He wants mm-hmm. to see worker representation at corporations like Walmart, big businesses, to give workers say, and to maybe even give the workers collectively an ownership of the company, which would give them a say in the in the company's decisions. And that goes to my the, uh, another definition of democratic socialism, which is that you know the workers. In, in some fashion, have to control the means of production. That yeah, so this is your, just, just to, to clarify, yeah. this is your second pillar, essentially. This is the, the worker ownership uh, pillar. So, so the first pillar is sort of the, the overall Bernie vision of um, a, yeah. a universal guarantee of human dignity. And this, the second pillar is, is worker ownership. So go more into, in, into that aspect of it. Well, the argument is that what socialism is at core is it's, it's, the, it's the embracing of democracy broadly defined. And the reality of our workplaces in, 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 in the 21st century, but also in the last, you know, for most of human history, is that our workplaces have been autocracies or oligopolies. You know, we, we have this idea that democracy is good, that uh, we cherish the right to vote, that we cherish the right to elect uh, the people who have such great power over our day-to-day lives, you know, our local and regional and national officials. Yet, 
when we go to a workplace, especially if you're not even in a union, but even in some unionized environments, effectively your fate is at the whim of your boss. And that for most of your American audiences, I think it's all but one of the states that gets at will employment. So your boss can fire you pretty much at any time for almost any reason. I know there's you can't discriminate in, in some cases, but even that's a very big gray area in the United States, right? Like yeah. LGBTQ people can basically be fired for it. And there's yeah, there are some never- states... I- uh, yeah. I forget exactly how many states, but there are definitely there's a number of states where you can still be fired just for for being gay. And yeah, it's, and, it's and, and they absurd. can be open about it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like they don't have to hide the fact. You're like, and because in Canada, I'm sure there are employers who discriminate against gay people, and 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 but but will have to at least make up a reason why, besides their discrimination, right? And mm-hmm. so. Um, all of this creates this position where there's no real democracy in the workplace. So through things like worker ownership and cooperative ownership and strong unions in the workplace and a combination of all of these sorts of things, you bring democracy into the economic sphere. And so mm-hmm. it also ties into this idea that like here in Canada, like GM, they're closing or, or almost closing the Oshawa plant. Uh, we know uh, the General Motors is closing their operations in Oshawa and they're only leaving like 300 workers. Mm-hmm. And the whole discussion from from most of our political, you know, punditry and what have you is, you know, these jobs are leaving unless they can find a way to subsidize GM to stay. But no one's actually talking about no, no, no major voices are talking about. Well, what if like the government or the workers or a combination therein owned the factory and used it to build electric cars and used it to build electric buses and electric trains and you know the electric transit of the future nowhere is that discussion happening um because it's like we assume that that corporations and that capitalists have the divine right to determine what is economically viable or not and that's like the the nature of capitalism democratic socialism challenges that yeah it's it's almost this we're in this culture where we are we are so stuck in this in this capitalist mindset that we don't even explore ideas that are completely legitimate but because they haven't been discussed on on a broad scale whether it's through media or or, or from our, our, our uh, politicians we don't really have a a clear perspective on what we can do and yeah. i think worker co-ops a, a worker ownership really really uh goes into that and and it's something that is possible and many countries have worker co-ops and and, and we have worker co-ops but but not to the extent where where um you can you know you can imagine gm or yeah. that GM plant becoming a, a, a worker co-op. Yeah. Uh, just give, I guess, I think people get confused on on what on what worker ownership actually means or how it would how it would operate. What exactly is a worker co-op? Like, what is your definition of it or, or your view on, on what a worker co-op is? Well, well, like with anything, like flexibility is important and context is important. There are some co-ops where like people run like a co-op coffee shop where mm-hmm. like you know, people could all, you know, pitch in and do the work and they pay one another a wage and profits are redistributed into the business or distributed to the workers in a form of dividend. It's like a form of shareholder relationship, but not in the distant sense where it's like some guy who has money says he owns a a portion of GM because he owns the stock. It's like each worker would in a sense be given a share of the industry. In larger industries, it might entail, for example, the election of management and the election of of corporate leadership, mm-hmm. it might entail broader say in the workplace in terms of, of of day-to-day operations. It might revolve around a council system where, for example, each plant, or if there you have a very large plant, will elect regional, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, section leaders to go mm-hmm. and make decisions for the company. These are and all the key mechanisms. word here is is elect, right? I mean, yeah. we're talking about people that are having democracy in the workplace. That's essentially yeah. what worker ownership is. You actually have a say where you spend most of your day. I mean, it's it sounds yeah. like uh, you know such an obvious concept, but we're so yeah. not not used to hearing it that that the idea of democracy in the workplace. I mean, it's when you hear it, it makes complete sense. But it's amazing that we really do not have these discussions and do not hear about this. Uh, you know, just from you know mainstream discussions or from politicians. Yeah, no, certainly, certainly. And I think this is really key. And this kind of goes into like the third issue, which is like worker ownership is key. Cooperative ownership is key. But there are certain things that just have to be owned by the public and not necessarily by the central state in Washington or Ottawa, although some things probably could and should be. But like municipal and state and, you know, community ownership 
of certain industries and utilities, I think is very important because the danger there is like if, if workers owned such a, a vital industry on their own, it might create classes of workers that have more power over others. And I'm always concerned about that. That's maybe more controversial position relative to different types of socialists who, who maybe feel that like all things should be worker and cooperative owned. But mm-hmm. I think, for instance, like banking should be owned by the federal government. The federal mm-hmm. government should control banking. Um, but with like telecommunications, you can have a mixture. Broad telecommunication networks should probably be owned by federal governments. But as we see in the United States, uh, municipalities now are setting up municipal broadband because yep. it's cheaper and more effective. And they, there's no competition in the U.S. There's no there's barely any competition in Canada either. Yeah. Uh, and that's Just why one example prices- of that. Yeah. Uh, in in uh, in Tennessee, I believe it's Chattanooga. They have a uh, public uh, public internet there, and it's it's fifty times the speed of of most internet in the yeah. area. I mean, it's we're, we're, like we're not talking about just you know a, a public option that's that's worse than everybody else. No, we're talking about a public option that is in fact better in the technology in the delivery of these services than these private companies are uh, are delivering it. Yeah. So even if you want to go to a, like you know, an end goal society where like the commanding heights of the economy are controlled by the public, you know, like uh, a, a, a long ranging socialist vision or you want something more immediate or more modest where it's like with key industries, there should always sort of be a public option to compete with like the oligopolies. So whether it's, for instance, like like, again, if, if municipalities offered their own broadband, they could compete uh, in some provinces in Canada. They have lower insurance rates because the provinces have insurance companies. So, you know, in in certain Western provinces in Canada that have had long-term social democratic, democratic socialist governments, they have publicly owned insurance companies that compete with, you know, Allstate and and, and State Farm and the the, the Mm -hmm. big big conglomerates. And even just by competing, they can offer consumers a better rate. So it's like you combine the idea of competition is good, but with the mm-hmm. idea of state ownership of, of, of at least some major industry, because that's important. And I think it's, it's vital because, again, when you talk about things that are so important, whether it's like energy or the means of communication or the means of the financial system or the insurance system, you know, private control of those systems, I think, really does endanger a society's sovereignty and democracy. And I think like, you know, especially in a case like Canada, because some of these companies are also foreign based. It increases that that danger there that if you're concerned about, you know, Canada's integrity, like security and and economic and political integrity, then foreign corporations controlling banking and controlling uh, energy and controlling uh, uh, telecommunications, it should be concerning to you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So just to kind of clarify and go over your three major points here, uh, you have universal guarantee of human dignity. Yeah. You have state ownership or public ownership and uh, and worker ownership. Yeah. So these three pillars combined uh, sort of, you know, uh, encompass what your vision of democratic socialism is. And honestly, I think it's it's incredibly tough to argue with any of this. I mean, we're talking okay. about a vision that really combines three different important aspects of uh, of life and, and how to manage these various industries. And the whole focus here is on the average person. I mean, how to make life better for the average person. And I think each of these pillars offer that in in their own um, distinctive ways. Uh, is there anything else that uh, you wanted to mention that I didn't get to here? Well, just it's kind of like how they all intertwine, because like mm-hmm. the w- w- on their own, they're all they, they would all improve society in many ways, but they would also have big drawbacks. So if you just have a universal guarantee of human dignity then there's always like there will always that that elite will remain and they'll always try to chip it away and this is the grand mm-hmm. story of like post world war 2 societies in Europe and, and in North America which is that you know after world war 2 these welfare societies were built up and quality of life improved literacy improved um inequality fell wages rose at the same rate that profits did the ceo to worker pay gap bernie sanders has talked a lot about this was 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 noticeable but not but not obscene it was like 20 to 1 not 300 to 1 and so in some ways that was like a more equal society yet though you know in the 70s and 80s and 90s that was all chipped away and the neoliberal order rose and inequality rose and privatizations happened and cuts to healthcare happened and cuts to services happened and and, and the quality of life has fallen and we see in some areas in the United States Life expectancy is falling for some people. 
Like, you know, life expect, you know, wages are lower mm -hmm. now in many places than they were in the 70s because of this counterattack. And so a system of just guarantee and good health care and good social programs on their own will always be under threat by like the bourgeoisie, if you will. Mm -hmm. And yeah. state ownership on its own is probably too much of a concentrated power. I yeah. mean, you know, I'm not I'm not like I'm not like a red scare person. But, you know, if you do if you do concentrate power too much, that's not really democratic either. And you could mitigate it by saying, well, not everything needs to be owned by the central government. If each individual city and county and state and and federal government all own different aspects of the economy, there would in a sense be a distribution of powers that didn't necessarily conglomerate itself in Washington or in, or in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it loses that democratic nature there. And the NDP in the 1970s talked about this. They said, what makes democratic socialism interesting is it's a it's a threat to both Stalinist communism, but also, you know, like, you know, capitalist society as well, because yeah. by empowering workers in, oh, in, in, in plants, both owned by the private sector and public sector, you bring democracy broadly defined into day to day life. And that's why that third pillar is so vital. But that on its own, I have concerns because, again, I, I do worry that if you just had worker ownership on its own, do you sort of create different classes of workers and do, do you replicate over the generations the sort of class society we have now? Let's say the workers who work in lucrative industries, do they you know, share the profits of their industry equally? But what does that say to the workers from less lucrative industries? What does it say to mm -hmm. people who can't work because of injury or because of illness? You need yeah. to have systems beyond just – workplace sharing of, of, of profits, uh, even democratically, to guarantee everyone a certain social standard of living. Yeah. And these three pillars, uh, them working together, what it really offers as well is stability. So, you know, we have a system right now where we're sort of at the whim of, of who's in charge and things can, can completely uh, swing back and forth depending on, on who's running things. But when you have a mixture of, uh, of state ownership, worker ownership, and that guarantee to human dignity... What it really does is is create this sense where, yes, you can still change things uh, depending on on who's in power, but th there is more stability there depending on um, you know the the uh, the the complete uh, breadth of of the ownership that is across whether it's people, whether it's the state, whether it's just yeah. this guarantee from the public. I mean, you have you, you, what you have is is a system that, regardless of you know the challenges that you may face as a society, there is going to be. A, um, a bedrock there that takes care of the average person. And I think that's what really this this uh, version or this vision of democratic socialism uh, offers. So, yeah. uh, Christo, thanks again for, for being on. Uh, advertise your, your YouTube, Twitter, Patreon. Where can people find you? Yeah, so I'm on, I'm on YouTube. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Patreon. It's just Christo Avalise. Uh, usually, if you just Google that, it'll come up. C-H-R-I-S-T-O. First name, A-I-V-A-L-I-S. Last name. I know David will probably throw in a link into the description to yeah, that. Yeah, I'll put video the links below about. below the video. But um, yeah, you could stop by and see me there. Um, if you like David's stuff, you'll probably like mine. Uh, so I hope you guys uh, will follow along to my channel. Yeah, Christo makes incredible videos. Definitely check him out. He has a an incredible depth of knowledge that that he that he brings into uh, his content. So definitely uh, check him out. Subscribe to his uh, his channel. And uh, Christo, thanks again. Thanks for thanks for having me.